Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first global virtual accelerator that we run from Silicon Valley with the mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of this mission, we've been doing these free mentoring sessions for years and years and years. We started back in 2008, and um, this is our 381st session. So uh, <laughs> we've had, you know, tens of thousands. I think it's definitely over 60,000 people who have pitched at these roundtables or participated in these roundtables, and then there are probably a a whole lot more who are listening to them in the recordings, which are available on our YouTube channel. So uh, you will find that at 1M1M Roundtables, all the recordings. And if you're live tweeting the show on Twitter, please use hashtag 1M1M. And uh, you can follow us at 1M by 1M and at Romana. Those are our Twitter handles. Um, our round table is a round table. It's not a broadcast. We want you to participate as much as possible, and that's how you're going to learn the most is by engaging. So these are the call-in instructions. We're not quite ready yet for calling, but we will be later. So line up your questions, you know, line up your points of view that you want to discuss, and by all means, call in. And of course, the public chat is wide open all throughout the session for you to participate through public chat. We're going to start today with a conversation with William Su, co-founder and partner at Mucker Capital. William, welcome. Thank you. So let's get to know each other. You're, uh, uh, tell us about the fund, how big is the fund, about your uh, own background, preferences, et cetera. Let's uh, get to know each other as well as let's introduce you to our audience. Sure. So um start with the boring stuff, which is the uh, the stats of the fund. Um, we are a $55 million uh, C-stage and pre-C-stage venture fund based out in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. Uh, we invest anywhere between uh, 15 to 20 companies a year, so slightly higher than most funds. Um, we invest um, at the very early stages. So for us, it's really anywhere from two guys and a piece of napkin. So really, really early, and we consider that pre-seed stage. And we yep. often invest that out of our accelerator program. And then um, as high as you know, millions of dollars in annual revenue, and typically in that case, we will invest anywhere from $100,000 to a million dollars out of the fund. Um, we okay. are about 50% uh, consumer and then 50% enterprise. Um, and uh, we actually uh, invest uh, typically not in the Valley. We About 50% of our portfolio is kind of Southern California and another 50% uh, all across the, uh, the United States. Okay. And um, on, on, go ahead. No one. Oh, uh, and on the uh, the personal background part, um, I was born in Taiwan. Uh, I moved and immigrated to the U.S. when I was 10 years old, and spent uh, most of my life actually uh, uh, in the Bay Area, um, and then went to school at Stanford um, as an engineer. And then uh, you know I uh, this was I graduated in the uh, beginning of the dot-com era um, in uh, kind of 98, and uh, yeah. like all these uh, kind of uh, naive uh, internet kids at the time, uh, we barely knew anything, but uh, we went out and just uh, started an internet company. At right, 22, I raised uh, close to $55 million and started an internet company um, that focused on building a SaaS software company for the commercial construction industry. Um, mm -hmm. Did that for for a few years, and then the market crashed in 2001, and uh, um, I had to be replaced. So my my VC fired me and uh, and hired uh, people with gray hair to kind of run the company since I was uh, you know, barely able to drink. <laughs> and uh, and then I uh, I uh, I went to business school for a couple years, uh, started my career over again, 
um, worked at a, a few pre-IPO internet companies and eventually ended up working at uh, AT&T as a senior vice president, uh, chief product officer for a division of, of AT&T. Um, and in 2011, um, I left AT&T thinking I was going to go and start a software internet company again because that's what I really love to do. Uh, but instead, I uh, got roped by my partner into uh, founding a venture capital firm instead. So mm -hmm. uh, five years later, um, we are here. Um, we are on our fourth fund. So uh, we have a little bit of a track record. We have about 75 portfolio companies to date. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. So let's uh, let's talk about the current portfolio. What have you invested in? How do you decide what to invest in? Let's. I'd like to understand your thought process. So uh, as you talk about the put highlights of your current portfolio, uh, give us some window into why you chose to invest in that particular company. How did it evolve? And if you had any notable exits, you can discuss that as well. So not just you know names of companies and um, industries, but a little bit more of your thought process of how you arrived at those conclusions. Sure. Um, some of our portfolio companies include companies like uh, Trunk Club, uh, which was uh, sold, sold to Nordstrom, uh, Tash Rabbit, yep. uh, so like Kia, um, Surfair, um, which is uh, uh, pretty well known in California as a uh, as an alternative uh, show hall air carrier. Um, Service Time, a large uh, staff company for commercial construction industry, um, a e-commerce uh, discount engine called uh, Honey, um, and 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 a few others. Um, how do we think about making a message? Um, the first criteria we look for are teams that are um, nimble and agile, um, that's quick on their feet, um, ability to experiment, uh, understand the data that's coming from the market, uh, quickly pivot, and then go back into the market again. Um, for that, that iteration velocity is super important to us because we invest so early in the Sounding cycle um, that typically whatever the original hypothesis about the company, or that is the problem they're trying to solve, the product, the feature set, the pricing, the messaging, um, some, if not all of it, is probably wrong. And that's okay mm -hmm. as long as uh, the entrepreneur is light on their feet and can iterate out of a jam. And so we look for teams that are not only kind of I call them uh, fully functional, i.e. Uh, have a CTO, a product person, potentially a go-to-market person, whether that's marketing or sales, um, mm -hmm. so that they can kind of go through this cycle really fast. Um, and then uh, we look for teams that's very, very low on burn, so that they have um, as much time as they need, typically anywhere from kind of 12 to 21, four months, to really mm -hmm. iterate. Uh, to kind of the final success, right? So okay. the faster you can okay. run and the more time you have to run, uh, the more likely you are to success, to, to kind of create success. So um, we we look for kind of that very basic thing in the very beginning because we're so early in the investment cycle. Yeah. So can you take us through um, a couple of case studies, let's say Trunk Club and Task Rabbit, two of your big success stories. At what stage did they come to you and did they have to pivot out of their original hypothesis and how did the, that evolution um, flow from your side? Sure, so um, you know, it's probably uh, more helpful to talk about companies that are newer. Um, I think Trunk Club and, and Task Rabbit have been around for geez, maybe seven, eight years now, right? So um, a lot of the newer kind of methodologies weren't really employed back then, right? That was when Lean Startup was just starting to become a, uh, a, yep. a, a conversational topic, right? So um, i give you an example of a company called uh, Honey. Um, it is... Uh, it's got over 100 employees now. 
um, doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars in revenue, um, mm-hmm. actually close to, to monthly revenue, so doing really, really well, tens of millions in monthly revenue, so doing really, really well. And um, it took them about a year and a half to two years to really find their footing. Um, at one point, um, one of the founders had actually had to go find a job, right? You, know, you mm-hmm. hear all these success stories of, you know, people with their eureka moment, and then within three months they raise $5 million, and off they go, and, and they're a unicorn in 24 months. Um, so it's a great story, but they are outliers for a reason. Um, it takes hard work yeah. at times to kind of figure it out, right? So the teams at Honey, um, they – they couldn't figure out a way to monetize their product. Uh, their product. So Honey offers a a browser plugin um, that is installed on a browser as a plugin slash app. It helps you um, discover um, new coupon codes, coupon coupon codes as you check out across the site, and it therefore maximize your savings as you buy things online. Right? Very simple idea. Um, in the beginning, the plugin went viral, and lots of people started downloading it, um, and it became uh, quite a bit of a hit. Uh, but um, you know, they weren't able to figure out a monetization model, so they weren't able to scale out mm-hmm. either paid marketing or even the team. Um, they could have easily quit and decided that you know that there's nothing here for the business to build. Uh, but instead, they figured out, hey, why don't we be cockroaches? Right? We'll just let the application continue to grow virally while we find other ways to kind of fund ourselves. And one of the founders actually uh, uh, went and got a job. And when the company hit close to a million users, um, they finally had some market power, and they were able mm-hmm. to go to e-commerce uh, retailers um, and partner with them directly for uh, marketing, co-marketing campaigns, as well as uh, affiliate marketing um, uh, relationships. Yeah. And once they started generating revenue, they were able to take that revenue and invest it back into acquiring new users. And then the company took off even faster after that. Um, and today, um, they're close to about 5 million users uh, using the platform. Um, so, um, so, you know, before we go uh, on, I'd like to actually um, – suggest that you um, send that company to me so that we can cover them in our Entrepreneur Journeys series where we do, you know, very lengthy, deep stories of Entrepreneur Journeys. Um, It sounds like a very interesting Entrepreneur Journey. Will do. Uh, Will do. I'm happy to connect you to the Entrepreneur. And and the other thing you said that I find interesting, I'd like to probe a little bit, is – you know, uh, we practice in our program, we practice a methodology called bootstrapping with a paycheck. And we actually support <laughs> entrepreneurs who are starting companies on the side. Just what you said is just to get a long runway to be able to experiment and find that product market fit. And often it takes a long time. It's not an overnight process. It's not a three-month process. It sometimes takes 18 months, 24 months to really find a good product market fit. And um, and there are very few methods of bootstrapping during that period. And as a result, we have, um, you know, learned from working with entrepreneurs and their journeys that bootstrapping with a paycheck has worked with for many people. And we started practicing this in our program, and it's working for our entrepreneurs as well. So it's very, very good to hear that um, you – actually supported an entrepreneur who needed to go back and get a job and, and bootstrap with a paycheck while he was seeking that product market fit. So uh, congratulations. Yeah, no. it's, it's out of the box thinking, and I congratulate you for that. No, no, not at all. I mean, you know, the in if you're starting a company in the Bay Area, um, there's a lot of angel investment money, a lot of VC. Um, we're based in Los Angeles, and the capital markets are just not as efficient. So, uh, well, it's, it's not, not just Los Angeles. Most of the money. world operates like that. <laughs> Absolutely, right? So the most of the world is like Los Angeles, where there is not a VC on every corner of the building, of the, of the shopping mall, right? So yeah. entrepreneurs yeah. have to be creative, and they have to find a way to kind of build their business that is not, you know, what you read in TechCrunch. Right? Yeah. And 
and we 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 encourage we support that um and and it's it's something that uh it's the reality of life for entrepreneurs so um there's there's no shame in doing it at all so um switching gears, my next question is about trends that you see in your deal flow. So we are at the very beginning of 2018. You have, let's say, you've been in business for several years. You have, you're on your fourth fund. So if you look at the deal flow for 2017, what trends do you see? What are entrepreneurs working on? What is interesting? What should we pay attention to? Sure. So um, let me talk about the things that I, I see quite a lot. Um, entrepreneurs. Um, spend a lot of time kind of talking to each other and, and kind of pattern matching to successful companies that's getting funded. So uh, yeah. spend time, um, you know, they follow a trend, probably a little too blindly than I like. Um, for example, the beginning of 2017, there were tons of kind of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality companies um, that quickly shifted to drones. Um, and then at the latter half, uh, middle part of the year, uh, there were a bunch of kind of chatbot type companies. Yeah. And then at the end of the year, uh, we were seeing uh, more kind of, I call it um, kind of AI and, and SaaS companies. Um, yeah. yeah. Trends are interesting and they're good, especially if they have a platform paradigm shift from the end user perspective that creates new opportunities for distribution and monetization. Um, they're terrible when there is no data around actual user uh, uh, adoption and they're purely kind of a, a I call it an investment trend. Because um, yeah. typically at some yeah. point you got to figure out how to acquire users and make money and if there's nobody on the platform then you don't even have the basic ingredients for success. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, trends are great for curating the thinking. Um, but in the end, as an entrepreneur, when you think about what company to start, what problem you need to solve, um, it's still back to kind of basic 101 problems, right, um, which is how big is the opportunity, how painful um, is the problem you're trying to solve, um, is it recognized Rally across the enterprise if it is an enterprise solution, or is it 10 times better than the previous solution if it's a consumer solution? And that's really the only way you're going to um, exact change in behavior or purchasing pattern in your end customer. And those questions need to be answered whether it is an AI company or a Bitcoin company or a cryptocurrency company or, or a chatbot company. Um, yeah, you know, so our philosophy in happens. one million by one million is uh, entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits. Financing is optional, <laughs> exit is optional. Yep. So we focus very heavily on, you know, making sure that customers are willing to pay for what is it that you're selling, and and uh, whatever it is that you're doing, that is the fundamental, um, you know, belief system of our program. <laughs> Well, it's the so, fundamental belief of any uh, capitalist system, right? The, uh, should be. It's not. Possible. In Silicon Valley, that is not. <laughs> Silicon Valley w w operates on venture welfare, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the end, uh, the funny thing is that if you're able to prove in product market fit and you're raising money simply for distribution and go to market, um, they see like that story quite a lot too, right? If you look at our portfolio company, a lot of them are, you know, based out, probably based out outside of the valley, but at some point, whether it's Series A or Series B, they get they come to raise money. Cash. Yeah, they they raise money from the Silicon Valley, and mm -hmm. they're able to do it um, when they're so far away. You know, not because the founders go to the same cocktail party as the VC, but because it's a great business. Right? The customer yeah. love it. There's no churn. The users are retaining, and the money that's being raised is going to be invested in scale rather than trying to figure out product market fit or or some sort of uh, employee welfare. Um, it is really expensive <laughs> to grow the company, right? And if that's the case, you know, that's a lot less risk for VCs too, and they love it. Yeah. So um, 
switching gears again on the line of questioning, how do you process the current investment climate where capital is moving further and further upstream? How does a seed investor, in your case, even a pre-seed investor, mitigate the Series A gap? Yeah, so um, I we are somewhat of a contrarian in the VC world. Um, most successful VCs, um, the way they make more money is to raise a bigger and a larger fund. And when you mm -hmm. do that, um, you're forced to invest in later stage companies. And right. um, if right. I'm simply thinking about my checkbook and the fees I'm making for my investors in my fund, that's obviously what I should be doing. Um, we, Eric and I are both, my partners and I are both um, entrepreneurs first and VC second. We see, we saw us building Muck as an entrepreneurial venture. Like we think of ourselves as an entrepreneur first. We started Mucker. It's a company that we started just like any other company. So we like this early stage. We like the stage we're in. So um, we are raising bigger funds than we were before, but we're staying as early as possible. As other VCs move up stage, upstream, we're actually going as downstream as we can. And by raising a bigger fund, we are able to continue to invest in our company in consecutive rounds by ourselves, right? So that means that we can put in 150K on the first check, another 200K maybe 12 months later, and then another 500K uh, six months later. So we can support mm -hmm. our companies longer and help them bridge the gap to the um, So you are basically example, doing, yeah. planning to do it all yourselves as opposed to Until depending on the outside ecosystem. Okay, Correct. fair enough. Um, and and we do that um, not out of you know welfare as you call it. Um, we set very tough milestones for our companies, and they yep. make that milestone. Um, they can either go out and raise money from someone else, and then they can take out money. If they don't hit that milestone, then no amount of begging will then will will help them get money from us. Right. So right. we don't want our follow-on investment to be an emotional decision. It is a purely quantitative decision, and we come to that quantitative milestone without entrepreneurs yeah. collectively, right? So it sets yeah. the right incentives, the right goals, and the right way to work together and make, you know, running a business a, a, a business exercise rather than an emotional exercise. How do you parse unicorn mania? As a seed investor, you could get buried under later stage liquidation preferences. How do you protect yourself? Um, we we have a large enough fund now to continue to pour, uh, take Purata and 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 kind of continue to maintain our ownership and continue to uh, have preference on the on the on the on the capital stack. Um, and also, oftentimes because we come in so early into the company, um, we can make 10x, 100x way before our company becomes a unicorn. So oftentimes we will think about exiting an investment um, even before the company has liquidity as they raise their gigantic growth round. Right? Companies yes. are raising 100, 200 million dollar round. You know, it's time for us to think about exiting into those rounds rather than holding on for another yeah. two, three years. And I think so that is, a, I think that is a so, common um, wisdom that is emerging in the, uh, you know, early stage, pre-seed, seed stage, uh, small funds. Is that if you are going to have to go, you know, three years before, uh, you know, the large funding starts. It's okay, and, and it's a good idea to often start exiting well before the actual exit occurs. So in a way, the early stage and the late stage investment cycles uh, in the venture capital business are splitting up. I think the early stages are exiting yeah. into the late stages, and this is, I think this is going to be, continue to be a, a major trend in the investment cycles. Yeah, so if you if you think about it, 20 years ago when I was starting companies, companies were going public at 500, 600 million dollars in valuation, right? and right. VCs were exiting into those IPO rounds. 
So today, when a company is a unicorn, they're really a lot larger than companies that were going public 20 years ago. So yeah. the natural exit for VC, at least back then, was anywhere between 500 to a billion dollars. And, you know, those VCs were making good money doing so. So, you know, certainly it's case by case, but an early stage VC can make good money and support great entrepreneurs. Uh, by, yeah. you know, yeah. selling into rounds of valuation of anywhere between half to a, a billion dollars. Yeah. So, um, last question on trends. Um, one of my observations is that at the beginning of 2018, we are, you know, a good more than 20 years into the history of the Internet, the commercial Internet. We are in more than 10 years into the history of the smartphones, a lot of stuff has been built already. Nowadays, there aren't so many wide open opportunities out there to build very large companies, but there are many niche opportunities, and some of these businesses need to be built with small amounts of capital, let's say one or two million dollars and exited for 10 to 15 million, or even smaller, you know, invest 250K, 500K, sell for five to 10 million, are these types of investment opportunities on your radar? Is this something that you have appetite for? Um, I'm, yes and no. Um, I don't need to find unicorns, um, but I would like to find companies that could eventually be worth $100, $200 million. Um, okay. When it is okay. 15 20 30 it's probably too small for us, um, but mm -hmm. 200, 300, perfectly fine. Um, as long as the, cap the company is capital efficient and they can build their business with just our capital um, and then grow organically through cash flow, we're totally down for that kind of investment. Um, the expectation so that needs can to be set that. Can you put some quantitative uh, parameters around that? you know, $200, $300 million exit. For a good, healthy $200, $300 million exit where everybody makes good money, what is the optimum amount of capital invested, in your opinion? What kind of revenue levels do you target? Sure. So um, depending on category, right? So let's say it's a SaaS company or selling some sort of enterprise software solution. Um, typically, anywhere from 20 to 40 million in annual revenue um, mm -hmm. would be good enough to get anywhere from you know 100 to even 300 million in valuation. Um, mm -hmm. When it is a e-commerce business or selling some sort of product that has a, has a cost of goods, um, you probably have to get to um, closer to 100 million in revenue um, to get. Like two hundred, three hundred million dollars in, in valuation. Um, software businesses are a lot more capital efficient because it's more inventory cost. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for an opportunity that is sub unicorn in size, um, try to find businesses without an inventory or a cost of cost of goods. Right to build a hundred yep. million dollar e-commerce business you probably need to have a balance sheet of at least $25 million to support the inventory term. At a software company, um, you can get to, I've seen this, you can get to $20 million in annual revenue with five employees. Yes, um, uh, software companies can be very capital efficient. So what, uh, what is your assessment about the optimal amount of capital that you put into a software company to get to $20 million, let's say, in revenue? Um, I think you probably need anywhere from a million to five million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that depends on your price point and your sell cycle. If you can sell a high price point product and, and, and sell and close the sale within 60 days, um, you can generate cash flow fast enough to invest in growth without needing capital to hire people um, yeah. to kind of support yeah. the sales cycle. 
And if yeah. that's the case, um, you know, we will have a company uh, called uh, Service Time, and um, they raised about 500000 and that was mm -hmm. enough to get them mm -hmm. to about $10 million in annual revenue. Yeah. You know, my thesis on this smaller opportunity, non-unicorn, smaller opportunities, but those that I think are still fine for venture funds, especially small venture funds, is that, you know, you develop a product. The product has maybe 200 million TAM. You get product market fit, get to 10, 20 million in revenue, and do the rest of the scale, scaling through somebody else's channel who's going to acquire you as a strategic acquisition and can reap the benefits of the rest of the TAM as opposed to you investing in the full channel development to get to much larger uh, scale because developing a channel is a very expensive process. Yeah, there are, um, there are software-only private equity shops out there now that specializes in I call it acquiring companies in the hundred to two hundred million dollar range and putting together with other companies in that same range and then creating unicorns out of them. And oftentimes they will have a decently diverse portfolio of products and type of customers. Um, yeah. and that's fine. I have uh private equity shops like Vista and K one um have made yeah. this uh, a very successful formula for them. And and also so, I think so even I, I, I even larger that. companies are looking for stuff like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. You know, yep, yep. There's there's uh there's gonna be more and more of that opportunity. Um VCs essentially selling their companies um to private equity shops. Um it, it's becoming more and more common. Yeah. And so in, All right. in addition to strategic there will be financial buyers too. Right. So there are both strategic buyers and financial buyers for this class of companies, and it's a perfectly fine investment opportunity is the point that I wanted to make with you um, and for, for our audience is that please don't be so, you know, swayed by this whole unicorn phenomenon and, you know, that VCs are, would only be uh, looking at the unicorn phenomenon because right now the industry has changed and in the early stages, there are a good five, six hundred micro VCs or small funds that are operating with, some are still operating with the unicorn philosophy. Many of these small funds are still looking to participate in the unicorn phenomenon. But there are, I am now seeing firms emerging that are willing to look at different models that are more contemporary, more relevant to what's happening in the current universe. So. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that you are, uh, you know, amenable and, uh, you know, open to these kinds of opportunities. If you find uh, VCs outside of the Bay Area, um, you, you, I bet you'll find that uh, these are all very uh, amenable strategies for them. Um, yeah. Capital, it's just it's not easy to raise $50 million outside of the Bay Area. So no. the company has to find a way to be efficient. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right, um, let's switch to the mentoring portion of the uh, program today. Thank you, William, for sharing your uh, perspective. Um, folks, if you have questions, you can start typing them in public chat, and we will certainly take questions, but we are generally going to go to the mentoring, the entrepreneur pitch session now. Um, just to set some expectations. Remember, this is a working session. It's completely safe. We have no other agenda here other than helping you make some progress with your businesses. So feel free to discuss your challenges candidly and, uh, and listen to what feedback you're getting here so that you can process that in your own time to really figure out good strategies for your businesses. Remember, not all businesses can raise money not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. You can disagree with all feedback that you get today. It's your venture. You will decide on its strategy. But this, what, what I just said about funding is a fact. You cannot contest that fact. So you're going to have to come up with strategies that take this fact in stride. 
Uh, Ram Kumar RS is the first presenter today. Please uh, unmute your line, Ram Kumar, and tell us what you're working on. Okay, hi, good morning. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So let me let me move into the presentation and I will cover uh, what we are doing in a, in a very gradual way. Um, the pitch deck that you see today here is, is really not made for investors, but it was actually meant what we are currently using to pitch to our content partners. And we have found some resonance in what we are talking about, and that's why I've been invited to speak at the Global Content Bazaar in January uh, 19th uh, this month. Can we move to the next slide, please? So uh, very briefly about me, I'm basically a marketing professional uh, specializing in product management. Um, I'm currently running my own consultancy where I bill about 1,500 rupees per month, uh, sorry, per hour. Uh, and so this is basically like I'm incubating this business using this your concept of uh, paycheck. No, so basically I'm running my own consulting and I'm using the revenue to fund part of this uh, project. And my next, next slide, please. My co-founder, uh, Ashok, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, my co-founder Ashok is basically a techie, uh, very strong experience in IT, and he also has another company, a software, purely an enterprise software company, which is doing about $500,000 in revenue, and so we are able to fund uh, this business uh, from the revenues of the company using some kind of a debt arrangement, and so we are really not looking for funding uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. So basically, what we are trying to do is trying to try a new model of uh, monetizing uh, content, which I will call it as a cost per dialogue model, which is distinct from the existing models of cost per impression and, and cost per click. Can we move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so this is something that we are all aware of. Uh, as a consumer, particularly when we are consuming content, any uh, display ads or video ads actually are very intruding and, and irritating uh, to consumers, particularly in the context of media and entertainment content. On the other hand, we see media and content owners are really uh, worried that they are not able to raise enough uh, revenues from digital uh, for, for funding their content. And this is something that all the media uh, content people that we are meeting are, are agreeing with. Next slide, please. And, and the reason for this is because there is a lot of uh, ad avoidance it's like a vicious cycle, uh, and the yield is very poor, like 30 CPM to about 100 CPM. The average is about 60. And the quality of the content is also severely getting affected because of that. So what we are proposing here is a little one step ahead of the CPC, where we have a multimedia message, we have an option type question, and where the, where the consumer actually responds uh, with, a, with a click. And the click actually not only uh, communicates the answer to the brand in terms of what the consumer wants to say about that particular person, it also takes them to the landing page. So it's basically a combination of an impression plus a click uh, plus an answer to a question. But at any CPD, there will be only one question. It is not really a long opinion poll, but just one question at a time. And this assumption that we will get about 60 rupees per CPD is an assumption that has not been validated. Uh, we are going to talk to the brands from this month onwards. We have been talking to a lot of content partners till now. Uh, but this is based on the assumption that the current uh, average CPC rates in India is about 50 to 60 rupees. So we have assumed the same thing for the CPD uh, also. The other thing that we can do in CPD apart from the regular targeting is what I call as an iterative dialogue, where uh, what message you put out and what question you ask can be linked to the previous answers that you got from your target audience. So over a period of time, uh, the brand can build a, a relationship with their consumers and build a better insight about their consumers uh, instead of simply being a transactional advertisement like currently the CPI uh, or CPC models are based on. Next slide, please. So the uh, true TRP is trying to uh, aggregate uh, all these three sectors. Uh, so we have content partners uh, who will get uh, 60 to 80 percent revenue share uh, from whatever the advertiser is paying for the for, for CPD dialogue. And the customer can be given an experience, a content experience, which is free from display ads and video ads, uh, in return for just one or two CPDs per user per day. That's, that's all is required. And, and the advertiser actually gets 100 percent attention and recall. They get a lot of insights. They can do a lot of micro segmentation because of the iterative dialogue that is possible in this model and they only pay for response and not for the impression or the click. Next, next slide, please. 
And, and the resultant benefit for the content itself is that instead of rewarding eyeballs or uh, frivolous content, we are rewarding interactions, engagement, and participation. And, and fans are really participating in CPD once or twice a day on a more voluntary basis instead of being including into them. Next slide, please. So the way uh, we can integrate uh, Casper Dialogue model of monetization into a content uh, business uh, when we talk to our content partners is that A, prerequisite that they should really have very high quality content uh, to the extent that they are able, even able to um, justify subscription kind of a, uh, high quality content. Uh, and they have a lot of interaction and engagement with their audience and they have very loyal fans. This is a prerequisite for, for being a content partner for this. And if they have that, then we bring our platform uh, and help them uh, bring the audience interaction and engagement into their own digital properties, which is their own website or mobile site or, uh, or app. And we also help them with our widget, which they can integrate uh, with these, uh, uh, their own digital properties. So I, uh, next, so this basically, next slide please. So you will actually see um, uh, this being widget being integrated uh, in, this is a sample screenshot that will explain to you in a much better way that it supports multimedia content, it supports custom buttons, it supports uh, interactive campaigns and, and live polling. In, in the same time, it's like a timeline, okay? And it, you can also uh, generate uh, content. So you can also generate uh, polling responses from users. So the other method that we can use our platform is to ask loyal fans, like you have 100,000 followers, maybe 10,000 of them are really loyal fans. You could request them to participate in the brand sponsored poll and, and thereby you, you okay, add Ram to your Okay, Kumar, um, your time is up. If you have questions, ask your questions and, and we need to move on. Okay, so the question that I have is that uh, we are currently getting very good traction from the uh, content partners. Uh, and they are willing to integrate our widget. We are currently bootstrapping, so we believe that we can bootstrap and go for another 12 months. So we are just going to start uh, going and talking to brands uh, for doing these pilots. We today have about uh, 10 content partners ready to sign up with us, adding up to about a million users. So we want to uh, identify some potential brands who could uh, come and do some pilot campaigns on these 1 million users. So what is your suggestion on how we could approach brands and get them to do some pilot campaigns on, on the content partnerships that we have already uh, wired up. That depends up. entirely on what kind of content partners you have. Brand and content have to match segments, otherwise you have, you have to find brands that are interested in the segments of users that you, are, that you have brought together. Okay. Yeah, we, we have a mixture of, uh, uh, we have a TV news channel, we have a Marathi video content company, we have a stand-up comedy content producer, partly offline so and partly Kumar, online. I'm going to tell you something that I'm not happy with you about. You have sneaked okay. into this, pre this presentation opportunity. Our philosophy is people get to pitch once for free at these free public roundtables. You have pitched for free. You have pitched. This is this time. You managed to somehow sneak yourself into a, a presentation opportunity which you do not deserve. See, we operate on an honor code basis, and if, you, okay. if people in the community violate that honor code, I don't appreciate it. No, and I'm not going to answer any more of your questions as a result of that. No, I didn't understand Please do not do that again in the future. All right, we're going to move on. Kathleen Lesky is up next. Go ahead, Kathleen. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Samana. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Please go ahead. A uh, late Happy New Year from me before uh, I start, because it's the beginning of a new year. And can we go to the next slide, please? To the next couple of slides, actually. This is what we do. Okay. Uh, we are two people, me and my wife. We are together for seven years. Uh, yeah, Julia is somewhere in the back, but I will be doing the talking. Uh, we did a lot of projects, you know, mm -hmm. better or worse together, but we believe very much in this one. Next slide, please. What are we doing? 
We're doing something very simple. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And hopefully with the profound implications. You create digital content that we put into books so people can, well, sell more of them. Next slide, please. Uh, we, de we have developed for the entire past year a technology that semantically links printed media to digital experiences. And because of that, we can offer um, quite a big range of them. Next slide, please. Why do we do this? Next slide, please. It's something that uh, pains me very much. Uh, people don't read anymore. It turns out we made some research and it turns out that the cognitive effort that people need to do is too big and uh, uh, that produces lack of engagement from them. And of course, this uh, turns up into a decline in sales for the publisher for our client. Next slide, please. Uh, so much so that you will see publishers uh, explicitly shouting up this message in the book first that I've uh, been to. Next slide, please. Okay, what do we do? We have created a format that will play uh, genuinely on all smart screens that is linked to the printed media, and we want to keep it so. Next slide, please. Uh, our audience will have one app to download. It will find all the augmented titles over there. They will be able to see it on all their devices, on the big screens, on the, the Apple TVs, mm -hmm. on anything. Next slide, please. Here we would have a video that I can invite you to watch uh, later. Okay, yeah, how is yeah, this right working? Now, yeah. uh, this, is, this is very interesting. Uh, we have set up a model that uh, we call fractional film uh, that uh, uh, gives the actual publisher, as a producer, uh, the ability to make profit uh, from the augmentations that uh, they make uh, much faster than the usual producer. Uh, so much so, next slide, please. That uh, if a film producer needs to break even uh, uh, 300,000 people as an audience for a normal, for a minimum budget film, uh, our publisher will need 50 downloads to break even with his book. Next slide, please. Kathleen, can, if you, before you move on, let me give you a bit of feedback here. Uh, you know, you're several minutes into your presentation, and I have no clue what you're doing. I don't know about the rest of the audience. I don't know. Will, do you understand anything about what uh, Kathleen is doing? Does the audience understand anything about Kathleen is, what Kathleen is doing? And, and why, the I, reason I'm bringing this up is that it's you it's not acceptable to be that this far into the presentation and not be able to clearly communicate what is it that you're doing will what are you, what are your thoughts yeah i see. i mean i i i understand 50 percent of what you're doing but uh i still don't you, you need to create a, a demo a use case much earlier in the presentation well and i think the the switch from we were talking about reading books now we're talking about fractional films you have lost me completely. Okay, uh, I have stated probably in the second slide that we uh, attach digital content to printed media to increase sales. That's what we are doing. Right now we are but going where, through emotions of how but and this why. This slide is where you completely threw me off. Okay. I mean, you know, the, the rational thought process I was going on is, okay, you're, you are creating some sort of a digital promotion capability that would draw more people into reading books. Now you're talking about yes. budget of film, 3 million to 300 million. People who can't sell books do not have the budget to create 3 million to 300 million dollar films. So you've completely <laughs> lost me here. 
Okay, we are coming from a film, uh, from the film industry. I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm still a producer. Uh, my wife is also a producer. We know this uh, industry very well, so uh, we come in with what we know. Uh, for a publisher, the ability to create audiovisual content to attach to their printed media right now is much more cost effective than it would be for a regular producer. This is what that slide was about. And indeed, it is a bit technical, but if the video demo would have worked, you would have understood what we're doing. Yeah, but you have to assume that you're going to have to convey what you are doing to your audience very quickly. You know, if you if you get three minutes to speak, you should be able to say exactly what you're trying to say um, very quickly. Now, if you're talking about five hundred dollars to thirty thousand dollars in you know, content, digital content that you want to invest in promoting a book. I can tell you this, $500 is all very well. $500, $1,000 is all very well. $30,000 is not budget that books have. Most books do not have a $30,000 budget to um, to promote themselves. So we're talking your the, the, the amount of budget you're going to have available to augment books with digital content is minuscule, minuscule. So how do you do, how can you do what you're proposing to do within these minuscule budgets? That is the question that's, that you need to answer. That's exactly why it's called fractional film format, because it only gives uh, the publisher the ability to uh, augment as much as it, as much as they want, they can go on from as low as 500, and they can go up all the way to uh, whatever the uh, size of the augmentation they they need. So, to so have. now answer. We can't go on forever. Answer the simple question: How do you do content augmentation in digital formats? For a book, for a very very small budget, micro budget. So let's say let's focus on what can you deliver for a thousand dollars of to to augment a book. Sure. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, sought after, one of the most uh, requested cases that we have is trailers, book trailers. That is mm -hmm. something that you can get from us for 500. Uh, actually, a thousand dollars would get you a trailer of the book, and uh, would get you minimal elements, audiovisual elements that would introduce you the characters, the setup, the scene, the atmosphere, and so on. So uh, and that's what, what you would um, get. What evidence do you have that this is meaningfully impacting book sales? Do you have any kind of product market fit validation? Uh, with the, the uh, with the publisher, yes, we went as you see to at least three uh, book fairs, and we offered the, that solution, and uh, we got we gathered interest. And uh, with well, the, no, the that actual is not audience, the, that is not the right answer to my question. The the right answer to my question is how many which books have you done this for and what percentage of sales increase have those books seen? I'm not interested in knowing what book fairs you went and pitched this to. That is a go-to-market strategy. That is not validation of a business. Mm -hmm. We are what, is in, the, uh, what validation do you have? Uh, we're developing augmentation for two titles. Uh, this, project, this product launched uh, in January like literally a, a week ago. The the titles that we are preparing are, of course, pre-sales that we've got from people. Uh, since they're not yet into the market, I cannot offer you uh, uh, official statistics, but I can tell you that everyone that sees what we are doing, they want to see more. Okay, what is your question? What do you think? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, your concept sounds okay, but I, you know, it really just doesn't tell me anything, you know, uh, in terms of whether it's actually going to impact anything or not. Because the problem that you're dealing with is uh, 
you know, a market, an audience, a segment, or even a generation that has become very um, instant gratification oriented. They don't even read much long form articles. Forget about that books. Is so, um, so get, grabbing their attention and getting them to read books, you probably, my impression is that you may have more success with uh, audiences that are older who are, you know, more, who at least have some uh, familiarity and some still, you know, some habit from before of reading books where you basically, you know, use your uh, technology, your, your methodology to just kind of market books better. What do you think, Will? What, what is your impression? I think this is a very hard idea to, to become successful at because you have a platform that requires content and you need to get content and then you need to get users so you're in the catch-22. Um, you should think about how you can break away from either needing content or needing audience and really just focus on one side of the equation. Are you proposing uh, to do this, Kathleen, as a marketplace? Or are you proposing to be a service provider that actually develops these movie trailers yourself? Okay. We are actually a content company, and this is technology that we develop on top of our services. Uh, that's one. The other, to answer your question, yes, we will have uh, both a free portion where people can develop such augmentations and we are going to host them for free. They can do them collaboratively between them, everyone in the world, and we are going to show them and to host them. And we are going to have a premium store that, there is a premium store where we are going to put paid titles, the ones that the publisher invested for or we invested. I mean, uh, it's not just the publisher that will produce augmentations, it's also us. We are a publisher in this position. So how do you make money? You Are you a content producer who is producing these movie, tra I mean, book As trailers well. and getting paid As for well. it? As well. We make money in three ways. We offer the license for this format. We offer the uh, content for everything that is in, and of course the technology, if anyone wants to white label this and to have it on their own. So This is how we the, make money in this year, and next year uh, we are going to offer this uh, as a service. And so, so my advice to you, Kathleen, is to figure out how, we are, how you're going to make money immediately, and it seems to me, just based on what you've said, is you're going to have to make money by producing trailers for books that have the marketing budget of the caliber that you're looking for. And that is, so you're basically going to be a services company for a while, a content production services company. And you can build probably a, a certain level of a business based on that. It's not going to be a hugely scalable business because these kinds of services, businesses don't scale that easily. But you can build a business. I believe you can build a business producing these trailers. And, and you need to find a segment of books that have this kind of budget, because very few books have the marketing budget that you're asking for. Sure. Uh, once again, we are a content company, and this is what we are doing. Uh, and That's it's true. not just trailers that we are doing. It's, uh, it's, it's not just um, audiovisual content can be many things. It, you can have the, the 360 video, you can have live video, you can have interactive content. Uh, you know, children books can... But so so, I, so I, I'm saying that I buy your hypothesis that you are a content production company that does content production for various segments. You're talking about now using your content yes. production capabilities to market books. And yes. and yes, you can build a small business with that model. I, I buy that yes. thesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you so the next much for having me. Is, and thank you. You're well. very welcome. Okay. The bye, next presenter bye. is Damayanti Bandapadhyay. Please unmute your line, Damayanti, and tell us what you're doing. Hi, Shamana. Uh, good morning and a very happy new year. This is Damayanti. 
Um, Shamana, first of all, you know, many thanks for giving me this opportunity. And this really is a platform for me where I'm speaking a bit of validation on the thoughts that I have articulated in the next few slides. So, okay. uh, to be fair and honest, I'm still I'm working with IBM, and I'm a consultant, a business consultant. I work with the mm -hmm. leading technologies, and I take uh, clients' business problems to solve, uh, you know, through the consultative approach. And uh, mm -hmm. the idea that I have is a bit of offshoot from the daily struggles that we face at our work, and also, you know, a properly need which we see in the market today. And the need is to have a, a structured mentoring. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I can go a bit deeper as we move through the slides, but I just want to set the context, Shamana, that my idea uh, to be in front of you today is first to validate whether the whole concept and the, uh, the idea that I have you think is viable enough, you know, from your expertise. And if so, then, you know, we can discuss about how to take it forward. If we go to the first slide. Okay, so I think I just covered my introduction. And uh, so I'm calling it by the name of Minting. Uh, it's going to be a collaborative platform. Uh, we may, you know, for the sake of our drawing our imaginations, uh, we may think of this as a complementary model to something like LinkedIn. But it's not just going to be networking. It's going to be a structured mentoring-oriented networking. Uh, so today, you know, uh, even after 20 years of Google being in to, you know, into our lives very strongly, uh, you know, when we search for our requirement, it still ends up in list of pages. And the pages are today replaced by, say, microblogs or microsites or structured information. But yet it's still about, you know, a lot of content. But what people typically need, and, you know, when I say people, it's about the growing professions and the growing profession of uh, area of, you know, new professions like, say, artificial intelligence. Uh, new technologies, you know, new ideas, which very limited uh, people have understanding about. So, you know, this array of new professionals are really looking for a lot of structured mentoring and not just in a lot of pages and a lot of groups and unstructured uh, siloed information sites, right? So the objective that I want to bring on in this concept is, uh, you know, uh, it, it's sort of think of a collaborative platform where a mentor can be a mentee and a mentee can be a mentor. Uh, and, you know, they can just uh, have classified information across anything under the sun. It could be something like a professional subject or it could be something which is also a hobby, which may be a profession to somebody else. Uh, but the idea is really to, you know, make people uh, ac have access to the right information through the right resource. And uh, in future, you know, have the objective scalability in terms of, you know, having co-located uh, workshops or co-located presence, uh, you know, of some of these, uh, uh, these top uh, mentors in the network. Uh, so who I would say my users are, you know, and uh, I would say that my first target segment, if I have to launch this, would be a target set of the LinkedIn users. And with a bit of statistics that I have, uh, digged up, and it seems that, you know, the current user base of LinkedIn is close to 400 million. And even if we can target about, say, 80% of that in the next three years, then, you know, that will give us a substantial mass. And of that, you know, there will be a classification of some of them will be the mentors, some of them will be the mentees, and, you know, maybe the immediate followers and influencers could be, a you know, a defined category of mentors and mentees. Um, so the next slide, uh, you know, a very rough idea on how it, uh, you know, it's uh, aimed at working. So the operating model is something like, you know, think of it as like a portal, and it's a single sign-on, and I can choose to be a mentor in some place, or I can choose to be a mentee in a particular uh, field of subject. And that acclaim or that accreditation is something I can wear as a social badge, and I can, you know, kind of, uh, use social media to propagate that I am a mentor in, you know, these, these subjects while I'm seeking information or, you know, seeking to be mentored in certain other subjects. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, like a one-page portal for an individual and, you know, he or she can browse across different areas of interest that the person has and reach out to the right relevant person. Uh, 
and there are different ways that you can grow in, inside the network. So it's called as clustered, you know, clustered networking, as I would say. Uh, so in the, you could use scoring or rating or feedback, you know, that you get through mentoring a particular individual to get to your next level. So, you know, just like any maturity model, there will be tires and levels for somebody to reach the top level of mentor. And with that will be our first premise of, you know, pricing at commercial and commercializing it, which is what I'll try to articulate in the next slide, Somana. Uh, is that in the revenue model. So obviously, you know, the one that it could be, uh, you know, through advertisements. And advertisements, you know, could be from, uh, you know, this, the, uh, I would say the training portals like the, you know, Coursera or Udemy or even virtual universities, you know, who are coming up. Uh, and then subscription from, if you want to have a very niche question and you want to access, you know, some premium mentors, you know, whose time is really a valued asset, then that subscription will be charged, and the remaining of it is quite free. So you know, so that we drive a substantial mass. Um, and you know, at that level, you know, when you have a subscribed mentoring, and when you're paying for your time that you are, you know, spending with the, ment with the mentees, you know, it's mm -hmm. the highest form of social badge that you can show to the other uh, prominent, you know, social media websites like Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, so that's a very rough. Uh, idea of you know uh, the portal that I've ideated, Shamina, and uh, without getting okay, much so detail, I would first want to hear your. Avanti, I think we understand what you're trying to do. Um, that much you have accomplished. Um, it was a fairly clear presentation of what is it that you're trying to do. However, uh, you know, if you the first feedback that I'm going to give you is. Your target audience should not be 80% of the LinkedIn user base. You, if you want to do something like this, I would focus things mm -hmm. very narrowly and pick a segment and try to do what you're trying yeah. to do within that segment. And, and the, the comparable, the parallel that you could look at is us. You know, 1 million by 1 million mm -hmm. has an extensive mentoring service, but it's very narrow. It is Technology and technology enabled services entrepreneurs in the very early stages. The mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond. So it's an early stage mm -hmm. technology, technology enabled services entrepreneurship. We have intense content. We have a freemium model where we offer a lot of free content, industry coverage, etc. And then we have premium content and premium subscription, including extensive mentoring. So within a narrow audience, this would work. I think if you try to go too broad, it is not going to work. If you look at a company like Linda, for instance, lynda.com, it was you know, 20 years of work to build up a broad base of just content, no mentoring, just pure content, and, and build a subscription business based on which they sold the company to LinkedIn. Now, if what you're trying to do will require each person who wants to be a serious mentor create a level of content that is going to build their credibility as a mentor, and then you're going to have to, you know, attract a group of mentors and so forth. So the problem that you're taking on is many times more complex than the problem that Linda has taken on or the problem that we have taken on. And that degree of complexity is very, very difficult to handle. Will, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you to give us your initial thoughts. Is Will still on? Oh, maybe he's not there anymore. Okay, um, so Damanti, if you take your concept now and Mm -hmm. Go to a particular segment. You know, let us say you want to apply your model to artificial intelligence. And you want to create a network. You want to create a network of, you know, mentors and mentees within the domain of artificial intelligence. That might work. Mm -hmm. It's a hot field. There are a lot of people who are trying to learn artificial intelligence. You're going to need to look at all the content companies that have built subscription businesses like the plural site for instance if you look at plural site in the domain of technology 
on various technical domains, they have brought together a large number of trainers who train on various mm -hmm. different, um, you know, various different topics. And they have a subscription-based business right. where people subscribe to, you know, use their content. And, and if you want to layer on top of that a mentoring angle, that, that may be viable, but you have to be, you have to go very narrow and very specific so that you can attract a group of people with a very high quality set of mentors and very high quality set of content. Mm -hmm. So there are models out there that you can use, that you can study. Plural sites, the case study is on our um, blog. You can study it there. Um, there are other uh, companies that have done that model. You can study how one million by one million operates and, and create something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is narrow and specific and niche. If you try to go broad, it's not going to work. Sometimes that's an invaluable suggestion, Shamana. Thank you for that. So I, I guess we should take that as action and I, I will work on it. Um, so, I, and I, if, uh, if it's all right to assume that I will follow up with Maureen on the next steps uh, in terms of, you know, once yeah. I've narrowed down. If you just like hang on, I will possible. explain to you. If you just hang on, I will explain to you what are the next yeah. steps in uh, after the next presentation. So, and we can do more sure. Q and A after uh, afterwards in the session as well. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and you had questions about bootstrapping and so forth. Uh, right now, you have to bootstrap. You're not ready for any kind of financing at the moment, and it's not even clear to me whether this business is fundable or not. There's a lot of work, lot, lot, lot of work that you have to do before we can arrive at that conclusion. But uh, so for the moment, you okay. have to bootstrap. You just have to learn all the methodology of how to put one foot before the other and build a business that may mm -hmm. or may not be fundable, but, but, but you have to build a strategy for building a successful business. Otherwise, there's no point. Absolutely. Sure. We'll wait for okay. your queries, Shamana. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. Um, is Mutukal Appan on the call? I have your slides on the screen. I need you on the phone to be able to go through your pitch with you. I don't hear you. All right, so if I don't hear you, Mutukal, I'm going to advance to the next segment, and if you come on the phone, we can, um, we can try to do your pitch. So folks, if you like what we are doing here, Please bring 10 serious entrepreneurs into 1M by 1M. And the word serious, as you notice, is in bold. Why? Because it's a very, very intense process to build a business, and it's an intense multi-year process to build a successful business. So we only want to work with entrepreneurs who have the metal and the resilience to be able to work through that kind of intense process of business well building. The rest who don't have tenacity, who don't who have unrealistic expectations of, you know, um, quick rich kind of process, that's not the kind of entrepreneurs we're interested in. So all resources from the program are available at 1M by 1M.com. You will find a blog that is rich with case studies, trend information, learning materials, inspirational materials. And you can, just by following the blog, you'll learn a lot. And there's an enormous amount of free learning material just by following the blog. Then you have the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, where we have 12 volumes of case study-based books, 12 to 16 case studies per book. And, and we discussed earlier in the show bootstrapping with a paycheck, you know, people who have a job, a day job, and are trying to learn how to bootstrap a company, we are perfectly fine with that. That's just an example of one of the pieces of methodology that we have developed, and you can learn about that methodology, case studies that have succeeded within that methodology through that book. So there are many other, there's a book on women entrepreneurs, feminine feminism. There's a book on e-commerce entrepreneurs, there's a book on cloud entrepreneurs, etc. There's a book on billion dollar unicorns. So the books are also another very inexpensive way of starting to get into the methodology of the program. These free roundtables happen every week. So usually it's Thursdays. Maureen, you may want to change uh, the every Thursday online because 
from February onwards, it's going to be mostly Thursdays, but we have to switch to Wednesdays in some cases and so forth. So you'll find the schedule on the free public roundtable page on the blog, on the website. Then we have the full acceleration program, which is a $1,000 annual membership fee. You uh, get extensive methodology guidance, a full curriculum, help with business development, introductions to potential customers, channel partners, investors, media, analysts, so forth. We do help you with financing. In one afternoon, you could get introduced to 35 investors. However, you have to get to a point where you, we consider you fundable to get those investors' introduction. And then once you get there and you get introduced to investors, once investors start responding, we will help you negotiate uh, financing and so forth, but you will need to um, get to that point. And not everybody gets to that point because not every business has the characteristic of raising financing. So do not come in with the expectation that just by joining the program, you will immediately get introduced to investors. We only introduce you to investors if you are fundable. We will help you get to that point of fundability if your business has those characteristics, but please do not assume that every business is fundable or will be fundable. That's just something, it's a misconception that is floating in the industry in a very unhealthy way. And we're trying to help you get past that misconception and get, don't get caught up in that myth. Your goal is to become a successful, sustainable business. And there are many ways of achieving that. We have a good understanding of those methodologies and we'll advise you on what is the right strategy for you and your business. The one and by one and self-assessment is a set of questions that you can use to evaluate your business strategy. We strongly recommend you take your business through the self-assessment. It's a very, very um, good way to figure out how to put one foot before the other. Now, in doing so, you're gonna encounter methodology questions. There may be things that you don't understand, that you don't know. There may be methodology gaps in your understanding of how to build a business. You can go to 1M by 1M Basic and learn from the curriculum only option for $99 a month. Please budget about 50 hours minimum to go through the core curriculum and learn the core modules of the methodology. And that is going to give you a massive leg up in your understanding of how to navigate the startup universe. And, and you know, the thing is, the for learning curve for a first time entrepreneur is incredibly, incredibly steep and you are going to need to navigate that learning curve methodically and efficiently and quickly. That is what we're trying to help you do and um, just don't bounce around and waste your runway. Your runway is limited. Not only is your financial runway limited, your emotional energy is limited. So you're gonna have to you know, conserve that emotional energy and find efficient ways of learning and finding good methodology, finding good mentoring is probably the best way to navigate that learning curve efficiently. So go dig around on our website. There's tons of information. It's very clear what to expect from the premium program, from the basic program. There's lots of videos, video FAQs, FAQs. Figure out if this program is for you. It is something that is gonna require a lot of self-learning. If you're not comfortable with self-learning, with online learning, this is not the program for you. So, you know, our philosophy is that entrepreneurs who are capable of self-learning are the ones who become successful. The ones who are not capable of self-learning do not become successful. And, you know, we just want to set the expectations for you that we are not able to help you if you're not comfortable with a lot of self-learning using what we are going to give you here in terms of methodology and tools. It's like a gym membership. You cannot lose weight and get in shape just by buying a gym membership. You're gonna to have to put in the effort. And if you're not gonna do that, we cannot help you. We just do not have the capacity to help you. The program is completely case study based. It's case studies and video lectures of over 800 successful entrepreneurs whose journeys you're gonna follow, whose 
methodologies you're going to follow, whose strategies you're going to follow, and you're going to stand on the shoulders of people who have done it before. You're going to learn from them, and you're going to implement those strategies in your businesses. That is how we operate. The methodology is lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. Even if you want to raise money, you're going to have to bootstrap first and raise money later. That is just the way the industry works. Um, and we do have a huge clout in the media. We will be able to get you the word out about your business into the media using that cloud. So um, these are the upcoming free roundtables. And um, I think the February roundtable, February 15th roundtable, Maureen, you may want to change that to February. You know, I, I, is it February 14th? That's... Um, is probably going to be the third roundtable of February, not 15th. We're going to make that change. But most of most of the time, we have roundtables, free roundtables on Thursday morning. It's the third week of the month that we're going to shift to Wednesdays. Also, we have in-person rendezvous nowadays, Wednesday evenings at 5 p.m. usually. So please also make uh, use of that if you're in the Bay Area or if you're visiting the Bay Area, you're welcome to come and, you know, spend an hour with me at one of these in-person rendezvous. It happens in Menlo Park at Cafe Boroni right now. Uh, venues may change in the future. For the moment, we are meeting in Menlo Park at Cafe Boroni. So you're most welcome to come to these as well. So now we are open for further Q&A. Any questions you have, any issues that you want to discuss, the line is open, the public chat is open. Make sure you send your, set your public chat to send to all participants so that everyone can see your questions. But we are ready for open Q&A now, and we have about nine minutes of Q&A available still. Um, also, it's a good time to introduce yourself. If you would like to introduce yourself in public chat, tell us who you are, where you're joining from, what projects you're working on, what kinds of issues you're dealing with, that you would like, um, you know, input on. Please feel free to use the Q and A any way you would like to. And while you're doing that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. Any questions about the One M by One M program? Just reach out to Irina, and she will be happy to answer your questions. Her email is Irina at one M by One M dot com. All right, questions, anybody? Shamana, if I may go first, this is Amianti. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you could enlighten us a bit about how to do bootstrapping. I mean, I know that I have gone through the courses, and I know it's primarily about starting off with, uh, you know, I mean, from yourself. But, you know, what do we do? What do you mean by you have gone through the courses? Investment. Have you gone through the uh, bootstrapping module in the um, in the program, in the curriculum, in the 1M by 1M curriculum? Are you part of the 1M by 1M basic through which you've gone through the correct bootstrapping no. curriculum? So that's your no, next not, step. Not part of curriculum, but I have but I have taken the, uh, I've read, read, read the blog and, you know, read the So your next step? Have. Your next step is to go through the curriculum, sign up for 1M by 1M basic and go through the bootstrapping curriculum and it's going to answer your question right away. Okay. Sajeev from Voltage is uh, introducing himself. Sajeev actually pitched last week, so if you're, uh, you know, uh, his presentation and the discussion around his business is in the uh, recording of last week's roundtable. So Sajeev, do you have questions? Perfect. You learn a lot through listening to roundtables. So I strongly encourage all of you who are still, you know, trying to use the free resources, listening to lots of roundtables is a very good way to enhance your understanding. And, uh, you know, and, and at any, any point when you're ready to sign up for either 1M by 1M Basic or 1M by 1M Premium, you're very welcome to do that. But there is a lot of free resources available. By all means, use those. Anybody else? Questions, comments, introductions, issues that you want discussed? Yes, no?
So the other uh, resource that is very helpful for those of you who are thinking about raising financing is go listen to the Investor Podcast. We started um, releasing a lot of our investor interviews as well as recording new investor interviews as podcasts. You can listen to those. And just this month, we have started publishing the transcripts of the investor interviews as well. So, you know, going forward, you will also have them available in text format in the Seeds Capital section of the blog. So um, get understanding what investors are looking for, how they think about businesses, how they evaluate businesses, is an invaluable way to enhance your understanding of business um, and of the journey that you're going to have to navigate. So that's another very, very good free resource out there from One Million by One Million that will also help you understand how to navigate. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments, issues, feedback? Yes, no? Sajeev, uh, will there be one-on-one -on -one meetings in the premium program? No. There are the same format in which you received your one-on-one -on -one mentoring, project mentoring in the public roundtable. You can have as many of those as you want in the private roundtables that are members only. There are no one-on-one -on -one meetings in the premium program. There are one-on-one -on -one meetings that we do not recommend you need to spend extra money on. Uh, they cost $750 an hour to meet with, to schedule meetings with me outside of the program, but you need to be in the premium program to have that option. And we don't really ask you to take that because you get what you need in the premium program. You, the premium program is very well structured. Most of our entrepreneurs have needed nothing beyond the premium program to make the progress that they need. And you get plenty of project coaching on a regular basis through the premium program. It should be quite enough for what you need at the moment. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? All right, folks. I don't see any more questions, so we're going to adjourn the session today. We'll meet you back here next week and uh, take it from there. Hope you make a lot of progress in the meantime and uh, keep checking in, keep using the resources out there. You know, over the years, now we've been doing this for over seven years, so we've created a tremendous body of resources for the community. And a lot of that is free and then some of it is paid. So even the, the resources that are paid are very, very economically priced. So hopefully you're going to get all the resources that you need to put one foot before the other and become extremely successful. So good luck, everybody. See you soon. Bye.